Welcome back. We're ready to pick up in Genesis chapter 9, beginning at verse 18. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you have made man to dwell upon the earth, and you have bid man to uh, spread, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to be fruitful and multiply. And though your people have kicked against those goads, nonetheless, you continue to bless us with children, and you make nations from us. So bless us as we open your word that we may come to know how we got to where we are, and that we see your goodness working through all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we left off. The Lord opened the door in the side of the ark, and Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their wives, and the animals leave the ark. Now, we're ready to pick up with what happens immediately afterward, beginning with verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Now remember, who's writing this? God the Holy Spirit through Moses, right? So, when Moses writes, Ham was the father of Canaan, Canaan is a known quantity, right? Oh, Canaan, right? When, when Moses writes that Ham was the father of Canaan, you're importing already a good deal of, of weight, right? Ham has other sons, Shem and Japheth have other sons, Canaan is going to be very important. So now you're at the, the, the part of history where all of humanity was re reduced to eight souls, and now the Lord is going to bid them be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. And so what they're supposed to do, this is a flash forward to chapter 11, what they're supposed to do is go a long way away to fill up the earth with them and their descendants. Verse 20. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So, okay, so here's the thing. We're not, we're not certain. It's, it's, it's not entirely certain from the text that Noah knew what the wine would do to him. Or that there had been knowledge of this, but that Noah himself didn't realize quite what wine was capable of. I mean, making alcohol, yes, and alcohol has effects on the, the mood and the body and everything, but... Or he was... He sinned. I mean, it, I mean we're not told... Ex well, I mean... He's, he's been on the ark for a year. And, and notice how much time has to pass because it's, it's, it's my understanding you don't just plant grapes and get get wine like within a week, right? <laughs> it doesn't happen that fast. Right. So one would presume that maybe years have passed. Um, so by this point, 
by this point, Ham has a son called Canaan because Canaan is the one um, may, maybe. The church fathers seem to think it was Canaan um, who went and told Ham. But in, in any case, um, Noah makes wine, he gets drunk, he passes out. This is a great lesson for the fourth commandment because First of all, what was, what was Ham's sin? He went and told his brothers, and it was obviously in a, in a hey, look at, what dad, look at what dad's doing. He was, he, was not, he was not honoring his father. He was exceedingly dishonoring his father. They dishonored their father. They dishonored their father. As a matter of fact, Moses seems mostly uninterested with what's going on with Noah right now. Of interest to Moses seems very much what's going on with Canaan. Um, so what happens is, maybe young Canaan goes and tells Ham, maybe Ham sees. Ham, rather than covering for his father's sin, and aren't we told love covers a multitude of sin? Ham and, and Canaan did not do that. They uncovered his nakedness. Now, if you want a real rabbit trail, uncovering the nakedness might have a dual meaning in that it might also refer to an act of incest. I, I'm not going to elaborate. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, uh, elsewhere in the Bible, that term is used for an act of incest. So, Shem and Japheth, they honor their father by taking the cloak. And what do they do? They put it between themselves. They walk backward. They cover up old man Noah, right? In this case, they literally cover his sin. Now, when Noah comes to, he speaks. It's easy to interpret this as like an emotional outburst, but it's not. It's prophecy. In other words, he doesn't go, you're cursed! He goes, what have you done? You're cursed! Understand the, the difference, right? Noah is speaking God's word here. Not as, not as an emotional reaction, but as, as judgment. God's judgment upon these three men. Beginning then with Canaan, notice he doesn't say Ham. He curses Canaan, Ham's son. Matter of fact, I think Ham's name only shows up one more time in the Bible, and that's in Psalm 105. So, great point. Um, chapters 9 and 10 and 11 are not exactly told in order. Right? Um, this is happening well before the Tower of Babel, the map you're going to see is happening before, during, and after Babel. Right? So, the nations are supposed to disperse. They don't. God is the one who has to disperse them. They all seem to kind of clump around the plain of Shinar. At least Shem and, and Ham do. So, first of all, there's, Canaan is cursed. A servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. Right? In other words, this is, this is now who you're going to be. Now, what's, what's odd is that there are a number of times when the descendants of, of Ham and even the descendants of Canaan will end up enslaving the descendants of Shem. For example, for 430 years, the descendants of, of, of a Semite named Abraham will dwell in the land of Egypt, which is Hamite. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 105, Egypt is called the land of Ham. And the Canaanites will, at various other times, enslave the Semitic peoples. I bring this up because, to answer your earlier question, um, slavery is a normal condition of humanity after the fall. It is not unique to the United States. It is not unique to the 17th through 19th centuries. It is not even unique to the English-speaking world. Different forms of slavery still exist in the world. 
to include open-air markets in places like Libya. That, that part of the world loves them some slavery and always have. Um, so, I know we're told that that's like the worst thing that could ever happen, and I would not want to be a slave. It's a very brutal sort of thing, but it is by no means unusual. And in this century, this nation enslaves that nation. In the next century, that nation enslaves this nation. There's a lot of back and forth. And at times, God will give certain nations into slavery. We read that in the book of Judges, right? Where Israel would forget the Lord. They would do what's right in their own eyes. And then the Lord would give them into slavery at the hand of some former or another of Canaanites. And then they would cry out and he would deliver them. So God makes use of that throughout history. Then, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be his servant, right? So here the Lord is called the God of Shem, presumably because Shem is a godly man. But there's a second meaning, right? Because from Shem will come the Messiah, right? That promised enemy to stand between the seed of the, the serpent and the seed of the woman is going to descend through Shem, right? Particularly through one of Shem's descendants called Abraham. And then 27, may God enlarge Japheth. Japheth's name means, may he enlarge. Let him dwell in the tents of Shem. What does it mean for Japheth to dwell in the tents of Shem? Well, if the Lord is the God of Shem, then the descendants of Japheth will, not entirely. By the way, um, it's, worth, it's worth mentioning, if you're not good with generalizations, if you don't like generalizations, you're going to have a really hard time reading the Bible. Because the Lord is going to speak in generalizations about peoples that are not going to be true of every single individual within the set. That doesn't mean that generalizations are false or wrong, right? For example, St. Paul says, all Cretans are liars. Now, if you or I were to say that, people would say, you can't say that, that but the Bible says it. So we have to deal with that. Generalizations are legitimate, and the Lord will generalize about generalizations. Jesus generalizes about his own people. You stiff-necked people, you're always resisting the Holy Spirit. Obviously, they're not all resisting the Holy Spirit. One, he is one of his own people. Two, his disciples are his own people. And yeah, Peter, but I mean, Peter's also a martyr. So, you know, we'll cut him a little slack, right? Um, but the generalizations are still useful, right? But also, remember that these nations that are going to descend from them, that we're going to talk about in the next chapter, they are not interchangeable Legos, Right? These nations have personalities and histories that are all their own. There's a particularity there, and there are promises and curses that obtain to certain nations and not others. We're all kind of used to, everyone is an individual, we're all the Borg, we're all interchangeable, everyone is exactly the same, all men are created equal. But the fact is that we all have histories, we all come from places, and the people that we come from, they may be virtuous, they may be non-virtuous, they may be small, they may be large, they may be, you know, whatever. God is going to make generalizations about nations. Don't let that make you uncomfortable because you, you already know what's the most important thing, and that is for which of these peoples, for which of them did he send his Messiah for all of them. Thus, you, mostly descended from Japheth, here you are worshiping the God of Shem thanks to an event we call Pentecost. But that's for later. So Noah lives 350 more years. I can't imagine living that long on each side of the flood to see how the world had changed. Now chapter 10. The packet that I handed out is kind of a... It's, I know it's nine pages long, but I promise it is very summarized. There's just a lot there. And if, if your tendency is when you get to a chapter that's full of names just to skip over it, you're missing a lot, especially this chapter. Because this chapter is the bridge between the world of the flood, or immediately after the flood, and Abraham. How is it that Abraham came to dwell in the land of Ur? 
Who are the peoples that are around him? Where do they come from? Who are they? What are they like? Um, why is there already enmity and division among them in ways that are not, are not healthy, are not wholesome, right? Um, this chapter helps out with a lot of that, especially since we have so much evidence in the Bible, but also outside of the Bible, for the existence of almost all of these, these men and these tribes. Now, when Moses lists the sons of Noah, Japheth is always last. We assume that means he's the youngest. Whether that means that they were triplets, like some church fathers thought, or he was simply the youngest, um, obviously we don't, we don't know. But he's always listed last, which tends to mean in the Bible that that's the youngest, right? Um, but here Japheth is listed first. And what's going to happen with Japheth is he does what, what, what often happens like with older brothers in a family. They go off to college, they move away, and you don't really see much of them again. That's what happens with Japheth. Japheth, he goes north. He and his descendants head north from, from the ark. You don't hear much about them. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll get like a line in Jeremiah or a line in Ezekiel about one of Japheth's descendants. You don't really see much of the Japhethites until the New Testament, when all of a sudden you have Judea, not Judah, but Judea, being ruled over by Romans. If you want to know how they got there, go read First and Second Maccabees. Um, it's a fascinating story. Um, but Japheth kind of heads north, and we don't hear a lot about him or his descendants. That's not going to be true of Shem and Ham. That's a different story. So we get Japheth out of the way first. We don't get as much information about Japheth and his descendants, but we get quite a lot. So first of all, the name Japheth, again, Japheth is the son of Noah. It means, may he extend, may he expand. It's, it also sounds like the Hebrew word for beautiful. In the ancient world, these people are often referred to as blue-eyed and, and ruddy. You know, ruddy is the, is the word that Dickens used of the ghost of Christmas past. Right? You know, like a red face. That was past, right? Present? Oh, present. Ghost of Christmas present. That's why pencils have erasers. Um, <laughs> Japheth is the father of many nations, particularly we're going to call them the Indo-European peoples. They spread uh, north and then east as far as Spain, uh, or what's going to be called Tarshish. They're going to spread as far west as like India. In Greek, the name Japheth is Iapetas. Uh, the Romans knew that name as Iapetus that got corrupted to Jupiter. Now here's the thing, right? We're always told, oh, well, all of these ancient peoples have their own mythology about a flood. And as we noted, maybe that means that the world flooded and they remembered it. That tends to be something you tell your kids about. Um, however, particularly among those who are not from Shem, and especially from Canaan, the descendants of these men are often going to obscure knowledge of the true God, right? So instead of the Japhethites worshiping the God who saved Japheth in the, in the ark, they're going to worship, worship Japheth as a corruption Jupiter, right? Jupiter is just a corruption of Japheth. Not the only descendant of Noah that that's going to happen to. Many such cases, in fact. Um, but very well known. Well attested, by the way. That seems like a just-so story, but it's, it's actually rather well attested. You're German, right? You worship Jesus, right? There you go. <laughs> so, at Pentecost, when the gospel goes forth, it goes to very much the Japhethites, who, not all at once... Not 100%, not always at the same enthusiasm level, but they do receive the gospel, and so you have Christendom flourish in the descendants of Japheth. I mean, we're a German church, right? I mean, we're, we're descended from... I'm not really that German, actually, but... <laughs> but, but this is the thing, right? German immigrants come to the New World, and they found a church that worships the god of Shem. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see it even here. But yeah, you're, that's, that's excellent. Yeah, every, everyone starts off with the knowledge of the truth. Some of them maintain it a little bit. Many of them lose it. Some of them intentionally obscure it. Again, Canaan, it almost cannot be overstated how much the Canaanites obscure the true religion and take everything that God considers good and turn it into evil and vice versa. It is, in many cases, a battle map, yeah. Especially because they live in such proximity. Um, my assumption is that it's going to happen for all those reasons. Okay. So these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. So they're born to all three of those men. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan, El Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans, in their nations. Right? So, they stayed more or less together. That is to say, they were separated from those that were not of their nation or clan. They spread out. And again, that spreading out is going to happen after the Tower of Babel, for the most part. Yeah, and, 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 and specifically in chapter 11, we'll talk about the languages. But yeah, each is going to have his own language. That's going to happen after Babel. Um, so Gomer, he's the father of Simeri the Sumerians. They settled on the shores of the Caspian Sea. Uh, we know that they were driven away by the Elamites. So Gomer shows up in Ezekiel 38, 6, the tribes that dwelt in the uttermost parts of the north. Right? Ashkenaz is a son of Gomer, likely settled in what we call today Armenia. So certainly far north of what we might think of the lands of the Bible, or especially around the Old Testament. Um, along with Gomer, Ashkenaz is associated with certain Germanic peoples. Um, to this day, for example, um, Germanic Jews are called Ashkenazi. And they are a distinct people group to the point that physicians will ask questions of people they know to be Ashkenazi Jews because they have certain genetic predilections that other, others don't. I was going to say, right, Ashkenaz is a, is a Japhethite. So, um, yeah, Jeremiah mentions him. Uh, the Assyrians called them Scythians. On page three, you have Riphath. Um, his descendants give name to the, 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 the Riphian Mountains, along what we call the, the modern-day Volga. Where's the Volga? Russia, right? Um, there's evidence for Riphath in Pliny, uh, in Pliny Mela, Solanus, and Josephus. So that's important. It's not essential, obviously. It would be true if only the Bible had witness to that. However, that these men are, are attested to in extra-biblical sources. Josephus is a huge one. He writes a history of the Jewish people. Um, it means that you're not worshiping a god who just came out of nowhere or... Um, is, is some kind of fantasy, right? He's dealing with real people on the same earth you inhabit, albeit thousands of years before you. Nonetheless, the same earth you live in, you are of their flesh. You're descended from some of them. And that same Lord that, that they had interaction with, whether they rebelled against him or they worshipped him, is the same Lord you worship, right? In other words, these, you know, these were real people. Um, the ancient geographers thought that Rif the, the Riphathians were the source of the Boreas, the north wind. Um, Togarma settles in Armenia. Um, this happens a lot that they get cut off somewhere around the 7th century BC. That is that their nation ceases to be not entirely sure why. Could be fertility, could be disease, could be war, any combination thereof. Whatever it is, um, there's no record of them beyond uh, the Assyrians. Magog, his descendants were known to the Greeks as Scythians. Uh, even before the gospel made it to Ireland, uh, the Celtic Irish traced their lineage back to Magog. Javan is a very important one. 
Um, the Assyrians uh, knew him as uh, Yamanu. The Javanites engaged Assyrians in naval battle during the reign of Sargon II. That'd be 8th century BC. In the Iliad, Homer wrote that the father of the Greeks was Yawones, Yawan in Hebrew, right? So Javan is the father of the Ionians. Those are people known for yarn, bronze vessels. Um, the Ionians are whom? They're Greeks, probably the most Greek of the Greeks, right? Athenians. Hebrews knew, knew them as the Jevanim, right, from, from Javon. Elisha, not the prophet Elisha, but or I guess you could say Elisha. Uh, he's the ancestor of the Aeolians, another Greek tribe, another Greek nation. By the way, um, tribe, nation, race, these are all more or less interchangeable. Simply means the people descended from one man, right? So when we talk about uh, Shem, for example, that's going to include him and his descendants, or Javan, him and his descendants, not, not just the man himself, right? The Phoenicians had a class of naval vessel called, oh, that's, oh, that's Tarshish, um, sorry, um, Elisha, Elisha, likely gave his name to the Greek version of paradise, the Elysian Fields. You've heard the Elysian Fields? If you've heard uh, the, the fourth movement of Beethoven's ninth, the, um, the baritone of the bass goes, Freude schöner Götter funken. And then the next phrase is, Tochter aus Elysium. Right? I don't know why some people think that's a Christian thing. It, it is not. It's praising the, the Elysian Fields. But, um, yeah, I mean, that, that concept, the Elysian Fields, persists in Western you know, civilization, uh, but likely got its name from Elisha or Elisha. The Greeks named um, autocorrect. There's not supposed to be an apostrophe. I did not put one there, I promise. Elisas or Elis. Oh, all these foreign names. I was fighting autocorrect the whole time I typed this out. It did not like any of these words. Even ones that should have known, like Japheth. Come on. Um, Tarshish. Tarshish is always described as a coastal place very far away. Likely would have been Spain. Um, it's on the Mediterranean Sea, but at the time was called the Sea of Tarshish. Right? Uh, the Phoenicians built a class of naval vessel called the Tarshish. The Phoenicians, of course, very famously sea-dwelling people, sea-going people. Kittim were known to the Phoenicians. They settled on Cyprus. That's an island in the Mediterranean, the, the eastern Mediterranean. Descendants give name to the Cypriot town of Kittian, modern-day Laranca. They're known to the, to the Romans as the Kitium, or the Citium, right? Dodonim, they're known to the Greeks as the Dardani of Asia Minor. To this day, the coastal regions are called the Dardanelles for this reason. Um, the progenitor was worshipped by the Greeks as Jupiter Dodoneus, that's a mangling of Japheth and Dodonim. So, again, more ancestor worship. Um, they were allies of the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh. Tubal. Tubal's found in the Assyrian inscriptions as, uh, un under King Tiglath Pileser I. Josephus records his descendants being called the, the, the Thobalites. They were called Iberes. Right? In the day of Josephus, and there's a false cognate there because, of course, Spain and Portugal are on the Iberian Peninsula. Surely there's a connection with that, but that's not what's being referred to. This is going to be modern-day Georgia, not Atlanta. Um, but the, 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 the former Socialist Republic of Georgia, now the, the nation of Georgia, right? Um, it gave its name to the river Tobol. Come on, autocorrect. That was an easy one. Uh, or, or the modern city of Tobolsk. <sighs> the river tool. Well, it's now been committed to paper. It's the law of the, the Medes and the Persians. No, it sure doesn't. Meshech is usually found in, in, in association with Tubal. Josephus knew them as the, Mos the Mosokeni. In his own day, they were called Cappadocians preserved in the tribal name of the Muscovites, right? Muscovite to this day is the demonym of people who live in what city? 
Moscow, and that's likely where they ended up. Tyrus, Tyrus, extremely important. The Greeks knew his descendants as the Tyrsinoi. They feared them as marauding pirates. The Romans knew them as the Thracians, but the Greeks knew them as the Thracians, right? This is the, the founder of what's called Thrace. History says they were given to, and the historian was very kind about it, tipsy excess. Uh, but they're also described as ruddy and blue-eyed. Tyrus himself was worshipped as the god Mars, but under the name Turas. Um, his name lends itself to the river Atyrus, as well as the Etruscans, Troas, or the Trojans, and the Taurus mountain range. They're up doing their own pagan thing, and we don't hear much from the Japhethites until, until really the Gospels. Ham's a different story. Here we have Ham's family tree. There's no easy way to say this, and there's no way to sugarcoat it, but his descendants were wicked people. Um, in, in almost every instance, they were given over to not just, not just idol worship, like you know they, they get some doctrine about God wrong. That's bad, of course. But that expressed itself in outward ways that are just disgusting. So rather than, for example, God giving life and, and, and preserving families, instead they're going to sacrifice children, right? Instead of the family, they're going to have orgies. Instead of, you know, sober-mindedness and, and, you know, industry and that sort of thing, they're going to have drunkenness. That, I mean, that sort of thing. So um, history doesn't know much about Ham. His name just isn't mentioned either in the Bible or out. I mean, after... After the incident with Noah, um, his name is mentioned one more time in Psalm 105. I'm not aware of it showing up again. Um, in Psalm 105, Egypt is called the land of Ham. Egyptians called their own land in their own language, Kam, from Ham. Um, the descendants of Ham settled northern Africa and most of Asia Minor. As, as the color map makes pretty clear, they live in very close proximity with the Shemites, to the point that it sometimes becomes difficult to know whether a certain nation is chiefly Semitic or Hamitic. Cush, we know him. The Egyptians wrote of him as Cush. That refers to the land between the second and third cataracts of the Nile, um, a land that we would later call Nubia. Right? Havilah, they settle in Arabia, overlooking the Persian Gulf. By the way, the, what we call the Arabian Peninsula is, is basically what you would call Asia Minor. Um, in the day. <clears throat> Ra'ama, he settles near to, to Havala. They trade with the children of Zidon. Sheba was a once fertile land. You'll hear the Bible talk about Sheba as fertile. If you look there now with the satellite, you're going to find it's not as fertile. Um, it was the land of spices, as a matter of fact. For a thousand years, it was quite fertile, but then the dam gave out in the 6th century BC, and that nation seems to have dwindled quite substantially. Um, Yemen, maybe southern Yemen-ish in that range. Hugely important is Nimrod, right? Nimrod is a very important name, especially as we get into the next chapter. Probably the most notorious man of the ancient world. He's, his, his name sounds like the, the Hebrew word for rebel. Um, he's credited with instigating a rebellion against God at Babel. Um, What's that? Yeah, Nimrod. <clears throat> and introducing elements of... Some people call somebody a Nimrod. Yeah. Oddly enough, Nim... yeah, Nimrod it was many things. Stupid was not one of them. I don't know why that's used to call people dumb. But um, Nimrod in introduces um, magic, astrology, human sacrifice, things that we would come to associate with paganism. Uh, Nimrod is worshipped as a god from the very earliest times. Um, his name gets perpetuated in many different ways. Nimurda from the Assyrians, Marduk of the Babylonians, uh, the Sumerian deity Amart Utu. Also as Bacchus, we know Bacchus, right? Bacchanalia or the Bacchanal. Um, that, that's derived from Bar Kush, the son of Kush. The mountain near Ararat is called Nimrod Dug, that's Mount Nimrod. The ruins of Birs Nimrud contain the remains of what was likely the Tower of Babel. Um, Sir Walter Raleigh in the 17th century writes a history of the world, shows a map where the Caspian Sea is called the Mar de Baku, or the Sea of Bacchus, right? 
Uh, one of the chief Syri uh, Assyrian cities was called Nimrud. The plain of Shinar was once called the, the, the plain of, or the land of Nimrod. To this day, uh, if you talk to Iraqi or Iranian Arabs, not Persians, but Arabs, um, they're likely to speak the name of Nimrod with some level of awe. Uh, Nimrod of Uruk is almost certainly Sargon of Akkad, very likely also Gilgamesh. Right? Gilgamesh is, is described as being a ruler of Uruk. Mizraim um, is, is the father of what we would call Egypt. In Old Testament Hebrew and in modern Israeli Hebrew, it, uh, Mitzrayim means Egypt. Um, Kasluhim, we don't really know where they settle from, but the Philistines are descended from them. Then you have Philistim. His descendants are called the Philistines. The Greek knew them as Hey Palestine. Uh, that would be the later name of Palestine. So Palestine is derived from the Philistines, right? That, that particular province uh, that was once Judea would come to be called Palestine as the Romans trying to quell the Judeans from rebellion um, as kind of a punishment. But I mean, that land's still called Palestine to this day. Um, the Philistine, after, uh, after the Assyrian conquest in the 8th century, and remember that also involved the destruction of the northern empire of Israel, um, the Philistine really ceased to be a coherent people. Genesis says they occupied um, parts of Canaan, even as, at the time of Abraham, especially along the shore. So, for example, um, Goliath is going to be from Gath. Gath is right on the Mediterranean. Canaan, of course, we know very well uh, because his descendants keep showing up all through the books of Joshua and Judges and even onward, right? In 1 Samuel, the, the, Philistine are gonna, the, the, the Philistines are going to rise up in power again, and we're in 1 Samuel in, on Wednesdays. Um, but the descendants of Canaan are going to dwell in what we call the land of Canaan. That's the land that's given to Israel as, as the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. And these people are going to be pagan, utterly outwardly pagan, disgustingly so. So don't, uh, don't weep too much for their destruction. Right, God told the Israelites to wipe them out and punished Israel when they didn't, if that tells you anything about their character. The Canaanites were kind of interesting because they are Hamites, but they speak Semitic languages. They tend to. That's going to make it much easier for them to intermarry and intermingle with Israel, which is going to be a problem and a temptation for Israel the whole time that they dwell in Canaan. Zidon, he settles the Mediterranean coast of Canaan. Uh, today it's preserved as the name Sidon, Sidon. Uh, his posterity were called the Phoenicians, right? Seagoing people, pagan. Heth is a progenitor of the Hittite nation. They're the first nation to smelt iron. The Battle of Kadesh was the first recorded historical chariot battle where the Hittites defeat the Egyptian forces. And then Jebus. Jebus are pagans. Uh, they're, they're Hamites that dwell in the mountainous regions of Judea, right? The city of Jebus became uh, Jerusalem. And remember, the Jebusites make a deal with Joshua. And they're not destroyed, but they rather become like a permanent slave class in the city of Jerusalem. And then you got Shem. We're given the most detail about Shem because, well, the next major character in the story is Abraham. Right? You need to know about where he came from, who his family are. Um, his nephew is going to come into play here pretty quickly. So Shem is going to be the progenitor of the Semitic peoples. The word Semitic derives its name from the name of Shem, the son of Noah. Um, so remember, Japheth goes north and east and north and west, and Ham goes kind of south and east-ish although not entirely so, Shem is going to occupy the southern and the central regions of Asia Minor, very close proximity to the Hamitic peoples, unlike the Japhethites, and so a lot of intermingling between the, the Shemites and the Hamites. So Elam is known to the Babylonians as the Elate, to the Greeks as Elimais, and to the Romans as the Elimei. 
Asher, not Asher, the son of Jacob, but Ashur, um, he gives his name to the Assyrians. So one of the Assyrian kings is Puzur Ashur I. He reigns about 1960 BC. He's deified, worshipped by his descendants. Um, his exploits, his, his life was read out daily at his image until the Assyrian Empire fell in 612 uh, BC. Supposedly, every Assyrian king only wore the crown with the permission of the ghost of Ashur, the son of Shem. It's kind of wild. But, I mean, pagan. Arphaxad, he's the progenitor of the Chaldeans. Their settlement was like four miles east of ancient Nineveh. So you can imagine they got mixed in with the Assyrians pretty quickly. Lud, Josephus writes their land was called Lydia, right? That's in Western Asia Minor. Uh, their descendants spoke an in Indo-European language. They're finally conquered by Cyrus in 546. Aram, founder of the Arabians, known to the Greeks as the Syrians. So in 1100 BC, they live east of the river Tigris. 400 years later, though, they're living all over Mesopotamia, right? Um, they settle in what's now called Syria, that, that we would call Syria, and the, the language Aramaic, which is a Semitic language, um, gets its name from Aram. You've got Hul, they were Bedouin robbers, they lived in the marshes. Modern Israelis, that is like the nation state that's founded in the, in the 20th century, they drained those marshlands, they put a nature preserve there, but they called it the Vale of Hula, right? Um, not the Hawaiian dance, but Hul, the descendant of Shem. Eber, enormously important. Eber is a descendant of Shem, he's the son of Shem. His name is going to lend its, its name to the Hebrew people, Hebrew means coming from Eber, right? For what it's worth, since we're here, it's probably worth noting that at this time, these peoples are not called Jewish. That name Jewish does not show up until the days of Ezra during the second temple because it refers to only one of the tribes, namely Judah, right? Um, when the northern tribe is destroyed, basically all that's left is Judah, and so the remaining is Israelites, are called the Jews during the time of the Second Temple um, and, and ongoing as the descendants of Judah. But until that time, we really don't accurately call them Jews, right? So, like, we don't really consider Moses a Jew. First of all, Moses wasn't, he wasn't from Judah, he was a Levite. He was a Hebrew, an Israelite, descended from Israel, that is Jacob. But that's the distinction we make when we name that nation, that typically they're not called Jews until the Second Temple. But obviously, the, the Hebrew language also gets its name from, from Eber. Joktan, his descendants, are some of the Arabs. Um, it's, it's hard to identify an Arab people because the name itself means basically mixed company or a, a mixed crowd. So Arabs can be both Semites or Hamites. Um, the Muslim Arabs are going to trace their lineage through Ishmael. And maybe that might be somewhat true, but it's probably a little broader than that yet. Peleg, his name means division, so his name is probably given after the, the Tower of Babel. He's the fifth generation after uh, the flood. That's when the nations were scattered, after all. Um, Terah, Terah's an important man. He is, after all, the father of a Semite called Abraham. However, Terah was almost certainly an idolater. In fact, Joshua 24.2 says he was an idolater. So I guess... He wasn't almost certainly idolatry, an idolater. He was an idolater. Haran is one of Terah's sons. He dies at a young age at Ur. They set up a statue in a city and named it after, after Haran. That city became a center of moon worship in the area. Haran has a son. His son's name is Lot. That Lot. Abraham's nephew. Right. Moab. He's the founder of Moab. Not all the questions are hard. Um, ben Ami, he's the founder of the Ammonite nation. The city of Ammon in Jordan is named after him. Judas Maccabeus in the in the first um, in first Maccabees, he confronts the Ammonites. 
They remain a distinct people all the way up then to that time, which would be 1st Maccabees is like 2nd century BC. You have Abram, later Abraham. Abram means exalted father, kind of a bitter name on account of for a long time he wasn't a father. Um, nonetheless, his name is exalted father, which, which is to say his name was itself a prophecy. Uh, but the Lord famously changes his name from exalted father Abram to father of many, father of a multitude, Abraham, right? Um, he's going to dwell in the land of Ur, a very pagan land. Midian, he's going to be the founder of the Midianite tribes of Arabs. Sheba, there are two Shebas. That doesn't help things, right? Keeping them straight, there are two Shebas. Uh, this is the Semitic Sheba. There's a Hamite Sheba. Um, the Hebrew word Rab, Arab, comes from Arab, mixed multitude. Um, Ishmael, he's going to be a son of Abraham, right? The Babylonian documents testify of Ishmael. For some reason, I forgot to put Isaac on there, but Isaac's rather important. <laughs> Isaac, son of Abraham. And his name means what? She laughs, right? Because his mother Sarah laughed at hearing he was going to come. And then Jeter, the, pro, the progenitor of the Iterians, known to the Greeks as the Iteria, mentioned in the works of Dio Cassius, Josephus, Pliny, Strabo, and known to Roman authorities as a band of robbers. In fact, their descendants perpetrated a massacre of Lebanese Christians all the way as late as 1860 AD. So to finish out the text then, now knowing all of that, the text of Genesis 10. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Put, by the way, is like um, modern-day uh, Libya, like between Libya and Egypt, maybe. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havala, Sabta, Raama, and Sabteca. The sons of Raama, Sheba, and Dadan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Hunter, of course, having a dual connotation, hunting animals and then eventually hunting men as a great emperor and an enslaver, right? The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna. So remember Sargon of Akkad? Well, there's Akkad in verse 10. In the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin. Between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Ananim, Lehabim, Naphtushim, Pathrusim, Kalushim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtorim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvadites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. Afterwards, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the, in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Admah, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born, the sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arpaxad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arpaxad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons, the name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almodad, Shelef, Hazar, Vameth, Jera, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obel, um, Abimeel, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All the, not Jobab, Jobab, how about that? All these were sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Sephar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. So, having prefaced all of this, these names with an accounting of who they are and who their, their descendants were, what, what Moses has done, of course, in the Spirit, you know, with, with the words of the Spirit, what Moses has done is to give us an accurate historical accounting of how the nations came to go from eight people around an ark to the inhabited world of that time. 
right? There's well, one thing I'd just like to throw out. There's, uh, you know, the, the, the one idea is that when Caleb was named that for the days of the earth was divided, that one was the spreading of the nations. But there's also uh, the, the speculation that that was the dividing of the continents. Mm -hmm. it, became, it became obvious at that point in time because at that point it says the earth was divided. And then later on it says the nations were divided. Sure. And again, which is right. Right. These are the clans of the son of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So in the next chapter, we're going to find out um, how the Lord spread them, the Tower of Babel, how the languages got to be separated, um, and go from there. All right, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.